Uh, for those of you just uh, joining in now, we're just going to wait for another moment or two and just uh, looks like, uh, um, you know, maybe the, the cold temperatures are driving everybody to come onto the computer. So uh, I'll just give you another couple of moments and then we'll, uh, we'll get started. All right. Um, so welcome, everybody. Uh, it's uh, Ian McPherson speaking. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Um, I'll just let you know a couple of uh, uh, little uh, things that are going on here. My um, able assistant, Carla Cesaroni, is sitting next to me. So uh, because when I'm presenting, I'm not able to actually see your chat window. So uh, Carla is going to be monitoring the chat window. And if you have any questions that uh, you'd like addressed, um, uh, Carla will be monitoring those and passing them on to me. Or you can, of course, yes, of course, you can always unmute your microphone. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you very much again for inviting me to uh, speak with you today. I, I'm, um, I, I'm coming to you um, from, well, I'm uh, in the, the boonies of Halliburton, but I'm also coming to you uh, as someone who's working with um, uh, faculty at another institution, University of Toronto. And I just want to start off by saying that um, I, uh, I understand what you're going through um, because our faculty at uh, U of T is going through exactly the same kind of uh, stress and um, uh, anxiety about what's going to happen in the fall. Um, uh, I, I recognize that you guys have just come through a full term. Uh, and uh, so that's already exhausting. And by this point, you're already tired. Uh, and you also uh, then were confronted with uh, the COVID um, uh, flip the switch changeover into your delivery of courses. And now you're, of course, you're starting to think about um, and be asked to think about what you're going to do in the fall. So uh, I'm here to uh, try and let you know, A, I, I understand that, but also uh, as one of the steps that of many that will be taken to try and support you uh, as you plan for what's going to happen in uh, September. And uh, uh, I, I, I just want to also sort of frame this as um, uh, this whole experience is, you know, it, it, for sure it's challenging and it doesn't help anyone to, uh, to hear that other people are going through the same thing. But um, rest assured that everything that you're going through at the moment will make all of the work that you do uh, in the university and your teaching activities stronger in the long run. So it's going to feel painful now, but I guarantee you, you are going to come out on the back end of this um, much stronger in your teaching and learning um, uh, activities. So um, there's three things I, I'm hoping that we can achieve today. Um, one is to sort of try and give you some ideas for what um, uh, online course delivery can look like in a, uh, in a large scale. So models for online delivery. And we'll talk about some key concepts in um, the best practice for online course development so that you have sort of some of those ideas in mind as you start to think about what your courses might look like um, through online delivery. And then we'll talk about some of the key pedagogical design and, and delivery considerations. So let's get a little bit into some nuts and bolts, but not too many. Today really is um, sort of a big picture um, idea. Um, I just see a little background on, on myself. Um, I actually started out exactly where you are. I, I was faculty. Uh, and um, when I joined, I uh, was actually quite intrigued by this really interesting new tool I'd never heard about called WebCT. And, um, and I really became interested in, in some of the uh, tools and technologies that um, were involved in um, uh, the possible tools for teaching. And uh, so I uh, moved into doing faculty support um, and eventually went off and did a graduate degree in um, distance education. Um, I have a major focus in instructional design. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to have been uh, uh, nominated for and or win um, various awards uh, for my work. 
I've worked in a ton of post-secondary institutions. That's the nature of this, um, this field. And so uh, I've seen the way it's done in a number of schools. Um, my longstanding relationship with uh, UOT, uh, UIT and, and uh, Germ College I've started because I was faculty at, at um, Germ College. And then uh, I had the pleasure of actually working with uh, Tanner and Andrea um, uh, at uh, UIT. Um, uh, recently, I was hired by the University of Toronto just over a year ago, and um, I was hired because um, there was a faculty in area that had no courses online. They were so far behind the curve. And I'm happy to say that we've done the whole zero to hero thing because uh, the materials that we are now uh, using and our faculty using uh, are being deployed across the university. So from my small faculty of kinesiology and physical education, now the entire University of Toronto are using some of our materials. So I'm hoping I'm going to be able to share some of this uh, background and wisdom with you today. Um, as I mentioned, this is a big picture story. Um, so we're, we're looking at it from 30,000 uh, feet. Um, you will see as well, though, there is a little bit of the airplane wing there. So there are a couple of little tools that, um, and uh, uh, techniques that we'll talk about. But in general, this is just to give you an overview of ways in which you might want to think about how you might want your courses to look uh, in online. Um, I'm going to uh, present to you um, a number of things, but there's some principles that inform everything that uh, I'm going to talk to you about today and which are best practice in uh, terms of developing online courses. So you might want to keep these in mind as you, um, you know, work on your courses. Um, one is that when you're teaching online and or developing materials for online, you need to be incredibly purposeful. So there have to be reasons for what you're doing and reasons for how you're doing it. And a purposeful approach will save you a ton of time, will make your materials much stronger, your students will benefit. Um, there's all kinds of upsides to being purposeful uh, and reasons for doing so. Your materials should also um, be student-centered. I know that's a term that gets banded around a lot, but it's a great way to think about your materials as you're developing it. What might my student sitting at home alone at two o'clock in the morning um, have to deal with in my materials? Is are my materials um, uh, is what I'm doing clear enough? Is it um, uh, efficient, effective? Is what I'm doing um, going to work for the student? And I mentioned um, uh, the question: Is it clear enough? Clarity uh, in online design is of vital importance. Um, you know, in a face-to-face -face classroom. We, we can tell from, you know, the, the growing murmurs and people, you know, leaning towards each other, um, asking questions when, when we're not being clear about what we're doing. We don't have that advantage in, in online. So clarity is of utmost importance. And finally, um, it's really easy to get, start thinking about the, uh, uh, you know, the, the tools um, and thinking, wow, this would be really neat to do. Um, but it's always important to come back and, and um, think about leveraging the strengths of what it is we're doing, um, of the medium in which we're doing it, actually, is what I meant to say. So um, the strengths of the tools, the strengths of the medium, leverage those, and your courses will end up um, uh, really, they'll pop. Uh, I thought I'd start out by um, addressing some of the common fears and misconceptions about uh, online learning. And there are lots of legitimate um, uh, fears. Uh, and um, a lot of those, as in most cases, um, with fear, it comes from uh, a lack of understanding or lack of um, connection to the thing. So I'll just go through and sort of uh, pull out a few of the big ones. Um, a big fear, especially for faculty, is that teachers are going to matter less when teaching online. And I can tell you, uh, and I'll show you, that nothing can be farther from the truth. In fact, teachers, not only are, are they as important, I would suggest they're actually more important in online. And we'll talk about why and, and, and how, you, uh, uh, how important it is that you are um, involved in your course and your specific knowledge and skills, how important those are in the uh, uh, development and delivery of your online courses. There's a fear that student won't, uh, students uh, won't learn as well. Well, there's lots of uh, research that shows that there's actually no significant difference between online and face-to-face -face teaching. Um, there's also evidence to show that many students actually excel at online learning. Sure, some have some uh, challenges with it, but um, the some 
shows that uh, there really isn't a significant difference uh, between the two. There's a fear that it's impossible or it's going to be really difficult to teach um, large online classes. And um, uh, rest assured that there are a number of strategies that can actually create, um, that can deal with online courses, but and they can also even create more personal connections than what you get in your typical large face-to-face -face, uh, classes. Uh, a number of faculty will report that they have connections with students that uh, because te teaching online, they never had or never would have had with that student in a face-to-face -face environment. And of course, there's always the fear that students can or will cheat. They already do in face to face. We know that. Boy, are they ever crafty. Um, but there are lots of strategies that we can use um, to reduce online cheating. I don't know if we'll ever get rid of it completely in any medium, but just because it's online doesn't mean that they're going to necessarily cheat more. And there are strategies to um, uh, reduce the possibility for such cheating. So, in order to sort of um, frame the conversation today, um, I thought uh, what I'd do is I'd um, focus on six key concepts or terms that you are going to come up a lot when you're um, dealing with online. And um, by the end of today, uh, you'll be experts in all of these terms uh, and you'll, uh, uh, you'll be miles ahead of everybody else at the university. Um, so one of the terms that you're going to hear bandied about a lot um, is asynchronous versus synchronous delivery. We'll talk about that. Something called backwards design. The notion of presence, both instructor and social presence in online courses. Um, the idea of active learning. A number of you probably already use that in some of your courses, how that is manifest in online. Um, Something that's very important for online uh, learning, and we sometimes implicitly do it in some of our course or classes, and sometimes we don't, is um, the notion of chunking. And uh, finally, um, the concept of designing for all. So those are the six things I'm going to uh, talk to you about today. I'm going to start off with the notion of uh, asynchronous versus synchronous delivery. And what do I mean by that? Well. Really what I'm talking about is sort of the uh, timing and the modes and ways in which we um, could potentially deliver our courses. Uh, and it's one of the first things that you might want to think about as you're conceptualizing how your course might um, uh, happen online. So there's two terms I mentioned, synchronous versus asynchronous. Uh, synchronous delivery is, is where everyone kind of shows up at the same place at the same time, not unlike your normal classrooms. Um, uh, you will you'll have people show up for lecture or you'll have them you know a group of them show up for tutorials asynchronous is something that's quite um, uh, is an online um, possibility so that is where um, students will go and access um, content or activities at um, multiple times depending on what their schedule allows what um, uh, you know perhaps, uh, you know, work, family, et cetera, um, where it's not tied to something that has to happen right at one specific time with everybody in the same room. And the nice thing about your courses in online is it can conclude both. So you can have a synchronous meeting time, maybe, a, you know, an hour a week where you'll have maybe, uh, um, maybe uh, you'll you do sort of the five key takeaways or three key takeaways from a, um, a class. Um, or, uh, and then um, a group of stuff that's asynchronous where um, the students will go and look at all their content, um, spend the amount of time they need on it to understand the uh, materials, um, you know, go over it, so some of the more challenging things. Uh, the other um, uh, issues related to timing are whether or not your course is um, very directed or self-paced. So when we're talking about a directed course, it is that Students will, uh, you'll release content at a certain specific um, time. They, um, they interact with it, and then you don't let them see anything else until uh, later on. Um, and, or you have a, spe a very measured way in which your courses would uh, take place. Where self-paced um, is uh, the vehicle where students can go and, and move through the course as quickly as they like. This is probably not 
uh, the way in which most of your courses will uh, happen. However, I, I bring this up because um, students really like it when they can have a look at the entire course um, and, and plan accordingly. Um, so as long as your content in later modules isn't um, uh, isn't going to sort of give away the show uh, earlier on, give them information that, that you want them to work through earlier on. It's often a good idea to, where possible, to um, make your course available um, fully when you start. Um, so they can go and look ahead and plan their assignments accordingly. They can go and just sort of get a bigger picture of what the course is going to look like. Uh, one of the biggest questions that I get from uh, profs that are brand new to um, teaching online or are coming from a very traditional way of teaching, uh, and let's face it, most of us teach the way we were taught, and so we were taught in a face-to-face -face environment, a lecturing kind of format, is should I do that? Should I use lecturing or sharing my content uh, live online? And here's some things that you might want to consider, because you are by no means limited to that. And in fact, there are a number of pedagogical reasons um, and attention span reasons and issues related to it that may make it not the best way to deliver your material. It's up to you to decide, of course. But here's some things you might want to think about. Uh, how big is your class? We'll talk about that in a little bit, um, because there are certain ways that uh, uh, certain class sizes that are better suited to lecture uh, kind of format um, than, uh, than others. Um, are live interactions with the students um, uh, uh, required? So do you need to interact with the student live in this um, in order to get your materials across? Or do your students need to interact with each other live as opposed to asynchronously? Um, so that's something to consider about. Do you have to schedule a class at a specific time? Of course, in our face-to-face -face environments or traditional environments, we have issues with classroom space. The classroom's got to happen at a certain time because that's the only time they can do it. Um, uh, but in online, there's a lot more flexibility, of course, with that. And of course, you need to also consider your comfort level with webinar or recording tools. Um, if you are not from, uh, comfortable with those, then pressuring yourself with trying to go and do um, lectures online might be a uh, it might be something you want, re, want to reconsider. Um, regardless, you should always play to the strengths of what the methods of delivery uh, offer you. So I'm going to break it down sort of by asynchronous and, and synchronous. In an asynchronous environment, and I think uh, this may have been shared uh, with some of you, this is developed by a colleague of mine at U of T. Um, in an asynchronous environment, the no, um, knowledge transfer or demonstrations um, uh, that's where, when that kind of um, activity is um, necessary or primary, asynchronous is delivery is probably better. Um, if the content can be shared in smaller chunks, if you have a larger class size, say more than 40 students, or if the content is not time sensitive, so where they can view it anytime, anywhere, asynchronous delivery is, is particularly well suited to that. Synchronous delivery is well suited to things like class discussion or where real time interaction is primary. Um, maybe the content needs you to explain it in a little more detail, a little more nuance, um, uh, perhaps picking up on feedback and stuff from students. Synchronous delivery then uh, is most appropriate. Smaller class sizes are best for synchronous delivery. Larger class sizes can get to be quite unwieldy. You can still do it, but there's bigger challenges. Um, and if the material is time sensitive, so if they need to be there at a specific time for something, then a synchronous delivery obviously makes some sense. So the rest of this um, uh, chat really focuses on kind of once you've sort of thought about some of these big pictures. How, okay, so how do I how do I now actually go and design my course um, and uh, to, to address that, I want to start um, by talking about something called backwards design. Some of you may or may not be familiar with this. As we go through this, um, uh, especially when we talk about backwards design, um, a big focus on this is um, going back to that guiding principle of being purposeful. Reasons for what you do and how you do it. Um, maybe I'm going to get to just a 
you can just type in your in the chat window uh, and uh, I'm looking over Carla's shoulder here to see uh, uh, how many of you have ever, uh, had this thought as you're do, uh, delivering your courses there's not enough time to teach everything I need to teach them I've got too much content now you can just chat you know maybe just uh, post a yes in the uh, uh, chat window and let me uh, or no if you think oh yeah I got it no nope, never had an issue always got lots of time so yes, if it's been a challenge for you at times, and no otherwise. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yep, never enough. Always a lack of time, absolutely. It is a common issue. I remember it as a faculty going, oh my God. Oh, and, and of course I always had to teach everything um, the first week, first term too in a program. Well, I'm here to tell you that I'm about to bring you great joy in all of this. Um, because backwards design will help you deal with that issue. And you're kind of going, what are you talking about, dude? Um, in backwards design, what we do is we actually start at the end of the course. So that is what we are saying students are going to be able to do when they finish the course. Uh, and learning outcomes are those um, statements. And um, it's kind of a contract, actually, with the student. You're saying to the student, if you take my course, this is what you're going to be able to do. Um, and of course, these have to be measurable. Um, we can't just say, you are going to understand. Because it's impossible to, under, um, uh, uh, um, to measure understanding. It is possible to say that you can identify, that you can describe, that you can analyze, that you can synthesize. But understanding is just too vague. So it has to be measurable. And why does it have to be measurable? Because we have to measure it. Um, we have to then answer, once we've said, OK, this is what you're going to be able to do, now we have to be able to say, OK, this is how I know you can do it. So we start by um, developing our learning outcomes. And once we've done, done those, then we go and we say, OK, here's how I'm going to assess you. Um, and uh, in the subsequent uh, meetings and or your, your teaching and learning center will be giving you uh, ideas on you know how to assess students in online but that's the next thing we kind of have to think about is how do I know they know what I say they know and once you've decided on that once you've built your assessments that is when you start to go and build your, your uh, materials in your course because we typically do it the other way around. We'll start off with look and we'll go, maybe we'll do our syllabus and then we'll have, you know, you know, 14 weeks or 12 weeks of, of uh, topics and we'll go through and we'll never have enough time in our classroom. And then around week seven or eight, you know, the first time we're doing the course, you know, oh, crap, I got to figure out what they're going to, I'm going to ask them in uh, the final exam because I got to post that. Well, you've already covered this because you've done your assessment method. You've built those first. And by doing so, now you know what you need to teach them. So what are they going to be able to do? How are they going to, uh, am I know they're going to be able to do it. And then we get to the point of how am I going to teach them what they need to know to be successful in this course. In other words, to successfully complete the assessments, which are an appropriate um, assessment of the outcomes. So um, there's all kinds of reasons for doing this. And it sounds kind of weird. But the advantages are that, first of all, it's student-centered. So you're always thinking about it from the student standpoint. Um, it's efficient because you only need to create materials that help them succeed at the assessments. You're not doing stuff that you don't need to develop because you're constantly keeping in mind, OK, you know what? They've got to be able to do this at the end. And uh, so this is what I need to teach them. Anything beyond that is a could do or a could know or a should know and doesn't have to be included. So what you actually build ends up being less. As a result, the learning is efficient for the students. Um, they know that uh, and, and it's uh, really clear and organized um, that uh, what they are learning is related to their assessments, which is related to the outcomes. So you end up having an um, really uh, improved clarity of, of purpose. And then we're going back to a couple of those guiding principles I mentioned, um, purposefulness and um, clarity. Uh, the next concept I want to sort of talk to you about is, um, is the notion of presence. Um, and uh, when we talk about that, when we think about presence, um, 
we think about it from the standpoint of the kinds of interaction that you have in a course. So in any of your courses, you have three sort of um, locuses of uh, interaction or centers, the instructor, the course content, and the students. Those are the three sort of focus areas um, in, in every course. And the kinds of uh, interaction involved um, in the instructor um, commenting on the content that's in the material, the student interacting with the content, and then, of course, um, the instructor interacting with the students. That's kind of your typical, normal, traditional course. In online, we're trying to um, develop another kind of interaction, and that is the student-to-student -student interaction, uh, something called social presence. There's a number of reasons for that. Uh, a couple of big ones are students in online courses will report that they feel isolated. They're at home alone. They're not in a classroom. And developing this student-to-student -student interaction um, makes them, uh, draws them into the course and makes them engage with the material. Um, and that's one of the biggest uh, reasons for uh, doing that. It also helps to um, take a little bit of load off the instructor because the students now, um, as the course goes on and that social interaction, social presence builds, the students support each other and they do so in ways that are meaningful to them, way more meaningful than any of us could ever be to, um, as instructors. So they are be able to talk about things in a way that's meaningful. And as a result, the learning, the content stick. So how do you develop this? How does this, how do these interactions all thrive? Well, it's through something called instructor presence. And instructor presence um, is uh, a key um, a method of, of providing um, regular strategic, and I have that italicized because you need to be careful about the way in which you do it, um, because you can blow your brains out. Uh, just drive yourself crazy trying to be present. You have to be strategic in the way you are. Um, but providing commentary and feedback, and um, it's in a timely way um, about the content and the student contributions. Um, I can't overemphasize um, the importance of instructor presence in successful courses. It is vital. Without instructor presence um, in a course, uh, your course is in most cases, doomed to very poor results, potentially failure. Um, your your course, your student evaluations will be uh, uh, low. Um, the, uh, the the comprehension, student comprehension will be low. Student engagement will drop off. Um, there'll be attrition in your courses. Instructor and presence is vital element of delivering your course. Uh, I don't know if any of you ever remember. Um, the uh, uh, that infomercial, um, the Ron Popeil, um, uh, set it and forget it cooker. You go and put you know ten turkeys into this cooker and just set it and forget it, and the crowd would all sing set it and forget it. Um, that will not work in your online courses. So you need to be present. And you remember that I talked about teachers being concerned about them not being so, as important. Nothing can be farther from the truth. You are essential to the success, success of your course. Okay, now is the time I give you the two for one deal. This is where we're going to talk about um, two of the concepts, um, active learning and chunking. Um, and it's because they're, they're related. And some of you um, uh, have heard the term active learning. It's been bantered around for some time. And why do we talk about it so much? Because it really works. Um, so I'm going to uh, um, pull up a little graphic here. Um, this, done, this is a landmark study. It was an interesting, um, interesting because it was done for um, a publisher. Um, as part of a, uh, a book on audiovisual methods and teaching. Um, so it was done for a book. Uh, and uh, Dale did this um, a bunch of research back in the late 60s, um, looking at how well we remembered what we um, interacted with and how we uh, were interacting with content. Students were interacting with content. And you'll see there's sort of two big sectors. If you look at the right, you're going to see there's a line above which we have what's called active learning, and down below are passive learning methods. Um, and in red on the left hand side there, you're going to see um, the items that uh, suggest that 90% um, of what we say and do, or 70% of what we say, is how much we remember after a couple of weeks. And some of you may have already taken a look way down the bottom at reading. We remember 10% of what we read two percent um, a couple of weeks later. And what do many 
um, first time profs who don't understand uh, online learning too, they throw up a bunch of readings on a page and say, okay, go read this. And that's their notion of online uh, uh, learning. So it's, it's pretty clear a number of studies have, have replicated this that, uh, and students will tell you, I learn better by doing. So active learning is a, a major principle um, that we should use in our um, courses. So I'm going to turn to another little uh, um, uh, thing here. I'm going to get you to, if you've got a phone, you can use it. If you've got a browser, you know, you want to open another tab on a browser, um, uh, you are more than welcome to do so. And I'm going to get you to go to um, the website. It's menti.com. And when you get there, it's going to prompt you for a code. So the code is 774339. And there's a question there for you. What's the average student's attention span? So if you can go to that um, page, I'd like to see uh, get you to vote. It's anonymous, so feel free to. Um, this is where the cynical uh, people in the world show up. Yep, there's the two percenter. Nice cynical. <laughs> right there with you. <laughs> I don't see anyone voting for three hours yet. Interesting. Let's give a couple of moments to let a couple other people vote. That's great. So, So Carl is reminding me to um, uh, mention, this is a tool that you can use. Mentimeter.com is the uh, site. I'll be happy to share links with you uh, afterwards. Um, this is a great tool that you can use in your face-to-face -face classes and you can use online. Um, you know how we hate to have students use their phones and they're dying to. Well, this is a great opportunity to let them do it. So um, uh, <laughs> see Stephen lost focus halfway through voting. Okay. well. It, yeah, you know, Stephen's a gamer, so that just comes with the uh, territory, buddy. <laughs> anyway, okay, well that's a that's great. So um, yeah, uh, very interesting. Um, this, lovely to see the cynicism here. The highest um, uh, uh, people saying seven minutes is the attention span. Um, well, let's let's actually look at the the what the data shows, and uh, I, I will remind you that. Um, uh, thank you, first of all, everyone for voting. Um, I'll remind you that these are general numbers. There's obviously going to be variation from individual to individual. But um, studies suggest strongly that attention span um, actually drops off significantly um, uh, after about 15, 16 minutes. Um, and for you cynical ones who were saying that attention was... Uh, uh, limited to seven minutes, you'll actually see that that's about where the peak of attention is. Six to seven minutes is where you have peak attention. Um, and people, when uh, I show them this curve, they're always looking and going, okay, well, that's interesting. I see, yeah, it really drops off. Okay, so basically after I've been doing something for about 15, 20 minutes, I've lost most of my students. So I always think it's hilarious when, uh, uh, well, I don't think it's hilarious. I just, <laughs> there's a reason why when you give instructions about the assignment, 30, 30, 45 minutes into your lecture, that's why students aren't getting it because they they just can't stay focused. Um, the other thing I it was always kind of a chuckle is people say, uh, so what about that little uptick at 60 minutes? What's that's about? Um, well, I don't know if you ever noticed, but all of a sudden everyone starts to sit up when you say, okay, to wrap up, to summarize, so everyone starts to, oh, okay, we're gonna pay attention again. So that's where you get your, your uptick. So, um, there are implications for these two things we've just talked about. Um, there's the need for active learning and we have limited attention spans. So what's the solution? So um, the solution is sort of a combination of what's uh, called activity-based design and chunked content. And I apologize, some of you already know um, sort of the basics on this. I'm gonna show you one model for delivering this, one model for how you might structure your course modules. It's just one module, uh, one, one model. Um, but it does a nice job of sort of summarizing and dealing with those issues. So it's called the Jumpstart Design Model. Uh, I think it's probably the worst name um, for a, uh, a lesson planning kind of model, uh, but it does the trick. In this um, model, 
um, you look at what your course um, or your mo uh, module ob objectives are, and that should inform everything you're doing. So what do I want to achieve in this mo uh, module? It should be informing everything you're doing. That's all part of that efficient design, efficient learning. And you've kind of dealt with that already in um, developing your, um, going through your backwards design, uh, a, mo um, uh, a big picture design of your, your course um, uh, design, your course planning. Um, so how does it work? Um, well, it starts off with, um, and you'll see everything here has activity built into it. It starts off with what's called a connection activity. This is a two to three minute little activity um, that uh, allows students to start to focus on the content. Um, you're not teaching them anything, it's just to get them thinking about it. So it could be a quick little uh, Rorschach test. You know, what's a word that jumps to mind when I say online course design? Um, uh, that would have actually might have been a nice little connection activity for this for this um, activity, uh, for this, this presentation. Um, uh, it could be maybe a funny little, funny little YouTube video or something on the topic. You're not teaching them anything. You're just getting to think about it. Um, and then what you do is you start to take the materials. And what you do is you take your content, all the stuff you want to teach them in that module, and you chunk it into what's called into little bite-sized pieces. So the little subtopic, a little um, subsection that sort of hangs together, shouldn't be anything more than 15 minutes it takes the students to do. And um, and that could be a reading, it could be a video, it could be an infographic that they have to look at, um, uh, maybe a web page that they're going to go and review. And then you um, present them with a practice activity. So you're changing up the mode, you're coming up with something different that they're doing, um, and the practice activity is designed to help them answer the question, how well did I understand the content in that previous chunk? Um, and what it does is allows them to sort of self regulate and self-modulate, okay, I, uh, wow, I thought I understood this, um, but this thing I'm doing now, uh, you know, I'm trying to answer this question or do maybe doing a short little multiple choice quiz or trying to post a response to a question to something on a, uh, you know, on a, in a, dis on a discussion or on a Padlet wall or any kind of tool that we might come up with, and I can't do it. I don't know what to say. So then they go back and then look at the material again. And the idea of, behind this is that they'll, uh, make sure that they understand the material so they, as they move forward, they're scaffolding their knowledge, they're building their knowledge so that um, they don't end up at the midterm exam thinking they got it. They did all the work, they did all the reading, but they didn't really understand it, and then they just get slammed on the midterm. Um, and you repeat this this grouping, this you know content and practice activity throughout the module. Um, once you've gone through the content, then um, you remember the students have been dealing with all these little chunks, um, so then you need to sort of pull it all back together again. So, you know, you need to make sense of all those, those, those bits and pieces, so tie them together, and then you um, present them with the summary activity. The practice activity is never graded. It's always formative. The summary activity is up to you. It could be, a, it could be something that they're uh, uh, graded on or not. Um, one of my favorites is actually discussion forums because those uh, allow for really higher order learning and, and really in-depth um, uh, uh, material um, and they take a little while but they are um, the kinds of things that students really take away but it's up to you and, and again we can talk about different kinds of activities that one can do so that's a way to think about um, how your modules might look like and by the way we're talking online this is a great model for using in your classrooms in, in traditional delivery as well uh, and I am told time and time again by professors that I work with that the the uh, what they did in developing their modules using this model has improved their classroom teaching immeasurably, and they apply these rules. So while it's really important, this is a very purposeful, clear way of delivering material online, it can help you down the road too. Some of the basic principles that we think about in this, of course, is active learning um, with that chunked content. But something else that sort of is implicit in that model is um, uh, attending to diverse learning preferences. Because you, you're doing things, you're chunking things out, you're going to do things in different ways. Um, uh, you're actually implicitly addressing the different ways in which our students learn. Um, there's no such thing as <laughs> learning styles has been heavily debunked. But learning preferences uh, is, is uh, a very important notion for uh, how we develop things. Because students, they don't learn just one way. 
but they have preferences and those may change depending on, on things. And to address that, we do what's called designing for all. It's our last concept. There, see, I, I said last and I can see all of a sudden the shoulders just came up. I know it, I can feel it. Um, when we talk about designing for all, we're um, also um, talking about something called designing for the edges. So we're designing um, for all uh, people. It was originally designed, the, the concept I'm going to talk to you about was actually originally designed to make materials accessible. So those who had limitations, those who were at the, at the extremes of the courses that had um, challenges, and how do we address and make sure that we include them? And um, uh, and ended up, um, ended up creating um, uh, notions of very accessible design um, and that has been manifest in something called Universal Design for Learning, or UDL, um, which, you, again, another term you're going to hear bandied about. So what is UDL? I'm not going to go into long um, detail on it, but um, because you, you, to train, do full training at UDL, you could take an whole weekend, um, which I have done. But the essence of it is that you're trying to go and think about different ways in which you are going to give stuff to your students. Because we saw readings. 10% retention after two weeks. We need to think about different ways. Not to say that you can't do readings or they shouldn't be there. Absolutely, readings are a key part of it. But we need to think about different ways in which we can um, present our uh, information to our students. We also need to um, uh, provide different ways in which they can express themselves, in which they can interact with the content. Um, so they can um, express, um, show that they uh, understand the material in different ways. Because some students, as you know, some are great at essays, but terrible at presentations. And the, the other, and the reverse is true. Or some people are um, terrible exa at exams, but they do great projects. Um, so we need to provide different ways in which we do it so uh, that we can address um, those things. And then the third, um, uh, multiple means of engagement, uh, of uh, uh, multiple means that we're looking at is engagement. So how we motivate and stimulate um, our interest in different ways than students. Finding ways that they can bring, um, they can relate to the material in ways that mean something to them means that the, le the, the concept, the principles, the things that you're trying to teach them will have uh, added meaning and it will stick. Um, so they're going to understand why they're learning what they're doing, what they're learning. Taking this approach, this design for the edges, actually helps everybody. Because even though it was, it was originally designed to make materials accessible, um, we found that, um, that all students would benefit. So um, uh, providing these different ways of, in, um, of, of say, um, providing the content, multiple means of, of representing the content, meant that, um, yeah, students who maybe have a preference for reading, but that picture also helped um, them. And so we find that the learning actually improves all the way around. So now the shoulders can raise, because I'm going to summarize. Um, what we've covered today in terms of uh, uh, the concepts are the different kinds of modes of delivery, asynchronous, synchronous, um, self-directed or timed, um, and the advantages of those. We talked about backwards design, so streamlining and making sure that all your materials are aligned, that you're developing materials that, that are um, uh, very closely tied to each other and only the materials that you need to develop. Um, the importance of instructor and uh, social presence in your course, um, uh, how active learning is so beneficial um, to um, students retaining material, um, why we need to chunk it, and um, the importance and benefits of designing for all. And as you think about those, you can see, uh, you know, maybe you can start to see sort of um, those notions, that principle of being purposeful, um, how it's always student-centered. We're always thinking about what's going to be best for helping them to learn, because that's our role, that's our job, to teach them. Um, and whatever we can do to make sure that they learn best, that means we're doing our job better making sure our materials are clear. And then when you're starting to think about um, the, the various things you do, think about what um, it's good at, uh, what it was best for, um, rather than just a flashy dancing bear that's on the screen. Ooh, that looks really cool. It might not always, the flashy tool might not be the best way to help um, students learn, so. Uh, 
I'm just going to leave you with one final thought, and then I'm um, happy to take some questions. Um, and that is that um, what's happening right now uh, is an unprecedented, op unprecedented opportunity for us to um, think about, reimagine how we teach. Um, it's a great opportunity to be creative, a great opportunity to stand back and go, you know what? I'm teaching this way because that's the way I was taught, but maybe it's not the best way. I wonder if there's a better way I can do it. You can add new tools to your teaching um, uh, war chest. Uh, and above all, remember that whatever you do with your course, you're going to make it your own. There is no one size fits all. We'll provide, uh, 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 there will be tools that will help you to speed things. You know, things like templates and stuff like that can help. But in all of those um, instances, you choose what you want to use, what's going to work best for your teaching style, what, what you're comfortable with, um, and what's going to work best for your content. So I hope that's been helpful. I'd love to uh, uh, take a few minutes now to address any of your questions. Um, and I will see if I can get back into Google. So if you prefer to uh, text, then I can look at that, and uh, or we can do it by microphone. Oh, I see uh, Tessa's, uh, or Teresa's uh, posted um, the uh, page on Jumpstart. Yeah, Durham is actually where I learned that from. Um, I worked with uh, the cafe uh, for a number of years, and uh, Jumpstart model is one that we use for their development. So any questions? Wow, you are well behaved. Natalie, yeah. Please fire away. I don't know if you want to unmute. Hi. Hi. Thanks very much for that presentation. Uh, that really was extremely clear and helpful. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I was trying to articulate something that's really very ambiguous and ambivalent at the same time. And it's not, it's not really a question. It's, the concern that, that maybe some of my colleagues share, that what it seems as if you're describing is two things at once. A set of principles and sensible instructions for how to design really excellent and effective online teaching. And at the same time, advocating a model of teaching, emphasizing its strengths, sort of helping us to understand why online teaching is a really great way to teach people. But, but I think at the same time that we're getting this great, these great sort of toolkit that you're offering us, and also the rationales behind some of the tools, some of us might feel a certain amount of resistance because our, on pedagogical grounds, because of the, the subjects that we teach and because of the techniques that we may have spent many years developing to promote certain pedagogical goals, the idea of teaching really well in an online course that can be taught quite asynchronously is not something that we see as promoting some of our most dearly held values as, as teachers of our subjects. <laughs> And so it's kind of a, this isn't really a question. I only say it because there wasn't any other question, but I think that it's, I mean, some of us, I teach in the humanities and for us in, encouraging student to student conversation and the scaffolding of learning in the classroom is already really central to what we do. And, and the concern about shifting to online is about all of those different modes of of wordless communication that you lose through the online connection. And I think we're nervous about if we completely throw in our lot with this model of teaching, we fear that we will never have the opportunity to do the very rich thing that we think can be done using appropriate technological tools, but that we think depends a lot on face-to-face. -face. Well, I think that's a great, um, uh, a great thing to be thinking about. 
um, and um, uh, you know those are like questions. How do I um, ensure I um, maintain those um, nuanced communications and um, those um, that that kind of connection in an online environment is uh, is a really important one to ask. Um, you know, not only in humanities, but I think in in many disciplines where that um, is important. Um, and I, I I would never argue that online is the same as face to face. It isn't. Um, and to, you know, with with pluses and minuses. Um, so uh, when you get into the process, that is something you know questions to keep asking and to to consider because. Um, well, on the surface, it may feel that you might lose some connections and um, uh, and absolutely, as soon as you get into a computer mediated co um, communication mode um, with online, um, you you uh, you have to rethink and and uh, provide supports, etc, for students to ensure that those communications happen in a way that isn't misconstrued, that, um, you know, we don't have that sort of facial, um, you know, those facial connections to sort of pick up on those those nuances. So so how do we make sure that, that we still achieve those goals, the learning goals, um, but with the, the tool that we have? And, and uh, you know, it's a superb question, it's a superb thing to keep in mind, and absolutely it should be, um, uh, 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 something that you maintain and you address and when you're working with um, any of your experts um, that's something that they will be able to help you with um, and, and certainly uh, um, at uh, the university one of the things that's actually been um, at, at U of T where, where I'm at one of the things that um, has uh, seen significant uptake across faculties and disciplines is a, um, is a, a course template that I, I built that has um, a, uh, an onboarding module that has that addresses a number of those sort of issues of sort of computer mediated um, communication. Um, things like netiquette, things like expectations in your, um, your online communications that help to um, uh, avoid some of the, the, the potholes, but um, also try to, leverage the strengths and, and work towards um, building those kinds of connections that um, understandably people are afraid they might lose um, when they uh, transition from face-to-face um, -to, -face to online. I, I will suggest um, just Natalie and, and for everyone, um, I, I, you know, I, I don't think this is an endpoint. It's not like we will never go back to teaching in the classroom. Um, we will go back to teaching in the classroom at some point um, and the advantage will be that we'll have all of these new tools that will add to what we do um, and that will make those classroom environments can enrich them considerably. I mean Mentimeter is a great example of a, a tool you know it, it's, a, it's a presentation tool really well suited online but all of a sudden you can use it in your classroom and your, and your students are, are engaged and feel connected to the materials which I think ultimately is our, our goal is to you know that student to student connection is 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 vital. Um, the learning is is the ultimate goal. So whatever we can do to um, uh, support that. And now that your 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 comments were really well taken. Um, I, I hope that it's sort of a non-answer and answer because we need to you know I mentioned to you, you're gonna make it your own. All of the course designs, all of your, what you do, um, should be focused very much on what you're doing. Uh, um, you know what what is comfortable for you, um, and there are ways to address um, some of those issues. They won't all replicate or replace, um, but they may um, provide new opportunities as well for you. So I hope that sort of addresses your your comments as much as I can, at least within this environment. Uh, Andrea, I, uh, you had a question. Hi, yes, thanks. Um, I think Tess and I are also uh, thinking along the same wavelength here. I was wondering if you could recommend uh, websites, resources for us to go and look at that would have additional concrete examples, particularly as many of us teach multiple classes that are more than 40 students. And so we can get an idea of additional 
engaging asynchronous activities to use in these courses, and especially so, so we don't end up having our students doing the same thing, but with a slightly different topic in every single course. <laughs> so if you have any websites that you would recommend we check out so we can, you know, find find examples that might line up with the the different topics that we're all working on. Uh, great question. Um, so there are, uh, there are a number of great resources, a number of the teaching and learning centers. Um, and I, I know there's a little bit of concern of what's happening at, uh, you know, sort of the kind of messaging you may be getting um, so far. I'm sure your teaching and learning center is doing what every teaching and learning center uh, at every institution is doing, and that is spooling up as fast as possible with resources. So I'm sure you'll see materials coming out um, from them shortly. Um, uh, uh, Teresa mentioned the um, Durham College um, Cafes page about uh, uh, Jumpstart. Now, I haven't looked at their page in a, uh, a couple of years, I will admit, but it used to have an, a wonderful collection of resources, very sort of um, uh, built in, in some ways around that, um, uh, or sort of grouped around the, um, uh, the Jumpstart model. So um, with uh, um, things that you could do for connection activities, things you could do for your content activities, things you can do for practice activities. And um, I found that to be, a, the, uh, that was one of the best resources actually I've seen of all the institutions. Um, uh, is there a one-stop shop? Well, um, there are, uh, I can certainly share um, uh, I, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll forward um, after the presentation, I'll send them to Carla to, to share with you um, a couple of uh, lists of tools. Um, uh, there's a, always a sort of a top 100 uh, educational technology tools um, list that is updated every year, um, which is fabulous. You know, it includes everything from YouTube to uh, really obscure um, uh, tools. I use, I like, th there's three I use a lot. Mentimeter is one because it's a nice visual um, representation. It's dynamic, so it gives fe students feedback on what the class has answered. And so when you go back, you know, two days later, there's new uh, answers, and it's got a wonderful collection of different kinds of um, uh, ways in which students can interact, respond to questions, and and or you know suggest material. Everything from open-ended text to ranking scales, um, you know, multiple choice. Um, reacting to images, etc. So it's a wonderful tool. Um, uh, I love Padlet. Padlet is like a virtual post-it note wall. Um, uh, it, it, uh, it's especially good for image-based um, materials that students would share. So you specifically tell them, and you need to be, again, purposeful in your instructions, find an image that represents this concept. And then, you know, give two or three um, sentences about how and why that that addresses that concept for you. Um, so it's wonderful. And another a nice little simple tool um, is something called Answer Garden. So it creates um, dynamic word uh, clouds. So great to, um, tool for connection activities, great tool for gauging comprehension. Um, as with all word clouds, you want an answer to be one or two words. Um, but it creates that word cloud automatically for you, and you can uh, all of these you can embed in your pages of your courses, um, and they make uh, they make things pop. Students love Padlets, by the way. They really like Padlets because it's a great tool for them to express themselves. None of these tools are assessment tools. There's no way to know who is doing, who is posting, and um, while most of them do have some filtering tools, you know, profanity, etc., yeah, you do, as with all, need to monitor any use, uh, use of any tool. Um, and students actually are pretty good. They'll let you know, hey, what's, you know, someone's posted something really offensive. So you jump on and, and you know, get rid of that. Um, so there's a couple of things just to, to start. Sorry, my assistant is is grabbing me over here. I don't know if my camera's on. I don't think my camera's on. No, I don't put my camera on. You can actually see the bad. Oh, no, it's on. Okay, it was. The bad hair day. Yeah. So I will share um, a collection of links um, uh, for you guys. Um, I'll get it to Carla, and then whoever is attended, we can make sure that they get it to them. Hope that helps. 
Hannah. I hope that Andrea did that help you. Did that answer your question to some extent? Just make sure. Hi, um, my question is sort of around. We we teach a lot of subjects around race, class, gender. These are all what they call difficult subjects. So they they evoke emotional responses. We have to be very careful about how we speak about them. And so my question is sort of around the idea of. What are your recommendations with these platforms and tools about creating uh, surveillance is the wrong word but a lot of what i do in the in class is when i say things and when people say things i gauge their responses these are also quite large classes too right and so uh it's 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 i can see i can i visualize it in a small classroom of say 25 i, I can't see it if if my class goes to again 80 or 100 people so maybe something to think about. So, um, uh, I just so I'm I, just so I understand your question, Hannah. So um, uh, it sounds like there's sort of two elements to it. One is your concern about sensitive content, um, and the second is you know how to deal with that uh, in a large class format. Is that am I understanding that correctly? That was that was really simple. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for well, it, it, it's always easier to edit than it is to write. <laughs> um, so yeah, one needs to be very careful. Certainly in in uh, um, you know in subject matter where um, you know there could be potential injury or you know con um, uh, difficulty uh, uh, that I would work you know kind of I, I would probably go and work with a. Um, an instructional designer to s come up with ways to make sure that you know language instructions etc um you know reduce bias in in those kinds of instructions present um environments that that uh, uh you know aren't all inclusive um and are you know non-threatening um i would in those kinds of instances probably choose tools um, depending on you know if you uh, you need to be purposeful and mindful about okay how is how is that information going to be shared is it to be shared amongst the entire class or is it just to be a uh, you know shared with the instructor you know there are certain activities that are best just done sort of in a one to one or you know you to the TA or smaller safer groups um, there's certainly lots of ways in which you can take a large class and use um, things like breakout groups etc to subdivide into small conversational groups that are much more manageable. Um, there are tools that you can use for that. Uh, certainly, for example, uh, in the ways in, in uh, you set up your course in, in Canvas, which you guys are all moving towards. Oh, by the way, I, all my work is in Canvas at U of T. Um, and I know that's another challenge for all of you to consider. Um, I think you'll be quite happy with Canvas as you get there, um, folks, the more you um, use it. Uh, I've used all the major learning management systems. Um, Blackboard has been always my least favorite, and Canvas is getting there for one of my favorites. So it, um, it, it it's kind of... Uh, I'm a Mac guy, so I always equate Blackboard to Canvas as, you know, Blackboard's the PC, Mac, <laughs> Canvas is the Mac. Um, so, yeah, there are a number of different places, uh, a number of different um, things to think about in that regard. Uh, um, you know, where, you know, think about how those conversations might happen in your face-to-face -face, um, environments. And then there are certainly ways in which you can address each of those as you move uh, to it. It's not... Uh, um, it, it just is all part of that being purposeful and, you know, kind of mindful in your design. Um, and again, I, too detailed to go into at the moment, but I can certainly provide you with some, you know, or your teaching learning people will be able to provide you with uh, tools that can do that. Canvas is well suited for that in terms of groups, um, a, uh, an authenticated environment, so they're not doing it out in a public environment that could be taken. All of those kinds of things can be addressed. Uh, are there other... Hey, Thomas. Thanks. Thanks a million. That was a really fabulous presentation. And I think you, you modeled uh, some of the strategies and, and techniques that, that we can that we can learn from. Um, my question, I guess, has two elements. Um, what caught my attention was at the start when you were talking about backward design and drawing our attention to how a lot of times we take for granted that students are learning and that it's really helpful to have 
uh, inbuilt practices and assessments to allow them to see their progress in the course. I guess my my concern is so the question is two parts. On one hand, I'm I'm concerned about the kind of culture this generates. Um, and what I mean by that is I find that when I use assessments like multiple choice, for example, that it, it really reinforces this idea of, okay, well, what's the right answer? What, you know, what's the answer to the test instead of the emphasis being on, on reflection, on learning and understanding? So I get that understanding is vague and difficult to define, but what are the forms of assessment or way of teaching that we can can still try and promote deep learning as opposed to this kind of uh, instrumentalization of the of the uh, pedagogical experience. Superb question. Um, so uh, uh, you know, open-ended or text-based um, kinds of answers um, uh, that uh, students will be asked to generate um, uh, and and provide their slant or their take on it um, uh, can absolutely be built into those practice uh, activities and your summary activities as well. Um, I, 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 at the risk of sounding boring, discussion forums are, you know, while they're one of the oldest tools, they have continued because they are a great forum for allowing students to work the idea and to think about it rather than the prescriptive um, sort of top down, this is the right answer, this is the wrong answer. Um, uh, so I guess you think about as you go through the different chunks of content, um, what is it you want to make sure that they've got coming out of it? So, you know, in your earlier lower levels, they're going to need to be able to identify and describe in order to later on be able to have those um, uh, deeper, richer conversations of, you know, where they're, they're interacting with principles or, you know, um, considering principles or concepts, et cetera, and to, to, to work with that. So, so perhaps in some of those earlier um, uh, lower level areas of, of uh, comprehension, multiple choice questions or multi-select or ordering, or matching, all of those kinds of things would be useful. Um, and then you would employ other tools um, that are, um, you know, that allow for more rich um, uh, expression of ideas and working with ideas um, later on, um, either later in the course or, you know, increasingly in the course or later in the module. Um, those might be, a, you know, that might be one way to think about it. So, so that you're giving them what they, uh, you're letting students get what they need, which is, first of all, I got the nuts and bolts. So now that I've got the nuts and bolts, I can go build the car. And the car's going to look different. Everyone's, you know, my car's going to look different. And, you know, as long as it's got enough wheels to, to, to work, and it may only have three wheels, or it may have 10. Um, but, uh, um, but I got to know how to, you know, got to know how a car works. Um, first, I got to have the, the, the bits and pieces. I got to have metal. I got to have, um, you know, rubber, those kinds of things. So uh, I think you can do uh, a little bit of both. Uh, it don't feel constricted by the fact that there's a tool that you know that exists that you have to use it. So quizzes or practice quizzes, um, qu answers can be open-ended um, answers in practice quizzes um, that students would automatically get feedback on. You could um, what I do with a number of my courses, um, and humanities um, related to social sciences is, is uh, you know, they do have practice quizzes. Some of the questions are multiple choice, but a number of them are open-ended. And then you know, the, the instructor provides some feedback, which we include in the feedback that the student gets as soon as they've done their question, answer the question. But, okay, so here are some of the, in order to, you know, if you were to do this on a quiz, on a, uh, an exam or an essay or something, these are some of the points that it would be important for you to talk about. Um, so it's not a, you know, it's not a directed question, um, necessarily a, uh, this is the only answer, but these are things that you would, um, would want to consider. Hmm. Yeah, uh, sorry, Carla mentioned just, um, and she's been quite taken uh, by this as well. And a number of my faculty at U of T, because remember, the people, the faculty I'm working with had no online courses. And when I canvassed them, um, we have about 60 faculty, a combination of, of uh, full-time and, and uh, sessional. Uh, three of my faculty, when I started there last um, March, three of them 
had taken an online course, one had taught an online course. And so they are, um, so you guys are way ahead of the game of those guys. Um, they were really, have been really taken by the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the activity in discussion forums. The level of discourse is so much higher than what they are getting in a face-to-face -face environment. Because, of course, students have time to think about it. So they frame their, um, uh, their, their thoughts more carefully. They go back and they reference the materials. Students are, are going and using APA and um, even seventh edition, <laughs> in, in, uh, and including those in their discussion posts. They know that their fellow students are going to be reading it. And we all know that it's more important of what their fellow students think than what the prof thinks. So here in a discussion forum, all their fellow students are, are going to read it. They don't want to look like idiots. Um, so that's one of the biggest surprises for faculty is, wow, the level of discourse um, in the discussion forums is, is wonderfully high. So, um, you know, uh, absolutely you, you can be prescriptive and at times it's, it's important to do so. Yes, this is the right answer, this is the wrong answer, but um, boy, oh boy, you know, the open-ended things can really create for some rich, um, rich learning and discussion. Sorry, I'll see if I can scroll and find that. Uh, how do you avoid making PowerPoint err on the side of all power and no pentacles? So um, I'm not sure if I understand the question. I don't know, Wes, if you want to, uh, you're still with us, if you want to elaborate on that. You can un unmute your mic if you like. Oh, is that Wes? Same Wes? Hey, Wes, I'm not sure if you're there. Um, do you want to unmute your mic? Uh, the other question, which an interesting sounding question, but I'm not sure I understood it. Any any other uh, questions? Anyone else? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Um, I was just going to say that based on your questions today, uh, two, uh, first, we're going to create a shared drive to everybody where, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So we're going to create a shared drive where uh, we will post this uh, webinar. But secondly, um, based on all the different questions and thoughts everybody had today, I'll speak to Ian about possible different resources, things that might be helpful based on some of your concerns, and we'll send it out to you. And hopefully that will uh, also be of, uh, of help um, based on, you know, teaching larger classes, teaching sense of material, those kinds of subjects. So. All right, well, it sounds like uh, yeah, we've probably gone a little longer than we should, but uh, so it goes with uh, any of my presentations. <laughs> uh, thanks very much, folks. I hope uh, I do hope it was helpful, and um, we'll look forward to sending you some materials. And uh, by all means, if you do have uh, more specific questions, your teaching, your teaching and learning guys are, honestly, they'll be getting up to speed. Um, but I'm happy to uh, address any questions uh, as well as much as I can. So cheers, folks. Take care.